Hi, good morning out there. My name is Bryce Fogel. I'm the lead pastor here at Jubilee, and we're so glad you chose to join us and gather around the presence of God with us. I just want to let you know how things are going to go. We're going to be singing about three songs of praise and worship to our God, and then we'll hear, have some time for announcements, and then we'll hear a message from God's Word. Just to encourage you this morning, Psalm 66 says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his names. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. When we gather to worship God together, that's exactly what we're doing. We're telling God, how awesome are your deeds. How great are you, God. We are shouting for joy. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and stand right now if we could. And let's worship together and shout for joy together and say to God, how awesome are your deeds. He saw me weary and sick with sin, and on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again. While angels in his presence sang until the courts of heaven rang. Oh, the love that saw me. Oh, the blood. me to the fold of God. The grace that brought me to the fold of God. He died for me while I was sinning, needy and poor and blind. He whispered to assure me, I found thee, thou art mine. I never heard a sweeter voice, it made my aching heart rejoice. me oh, the blood that bore me oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God the grace that brought me to the fold of God thank you Lord I'll daily ponder and sing anew His praise with all adoring wonder and blessings I'll retray. I've never heard a sweeter voice. It made my aching heart rejoice. Oh, the love that saw me. Oh, the blood that bore me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God.
we thank you what you've done for us, Lord, that you made a way for us to be with you forever, God, that you took that cross, you became the lamb on that cross so that we could be in your presence forever. We thank you for that truth today, God. Pray that you help us just to stay reminded of that as we continue through this week, Lord. Thank you, man. Amen. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Rachel, and I have a few announcements. First, we're really excited to be sponsoring a blood drive with the American Red Cross right here at the Jubilee Center. It'll be on Thursday, June 25th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. This is a great way to serve our community. Uh, if you'd like to be involved in this event, whether that's donating blood or even volunteering, please mark on your communication card and somebody will be in contact with you. Secondly, our life groups are continuing throughout the summer, which we're really excited about. If you want to know more about how this pertains to your specific life group, please contact your life group leader. And if you're not a part of a life group and you would like to be, please mark that on your communication card as well. Uh, our communication card is also just a great way to stay in contact with what's happening here at Jubilee. Uh, there's a spot for you to mark any comments or questions that you might have. So we encourage you to fill that out at www.jubileechurch.com forward slash cc. Also today, after the, the message, we have a really exciting uh, update from Bryce. So make sure you stay tuned to that. All right. Today, Simon's going to bring us a message from God's Word on the book of Galatians. Well, good morning. My name is Simon, and my wife, Ali, and my two daughters, we're part of the wonderful family of Jubilee Church. And for those who have recently been joining us, we've been going through the book of Galatians. And I have the task and privilege of going through the verses of chapter 3, verse 26, to chapter 4, verse 7. So we're going to go straight into it. And the slides are coming up. And it starts this. For in Christ Jesus... You are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heirs, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under the guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we just want to thank you for this letter that was written thousands of years ago. It's still relevant and it's still powerful today. And we ask it, Father, through what we hear today, by your Holy Spirit, you'll be our teacher. You would equip us where needed. You would convict us and uh, rebuke and correct us. But most importantly, Father, I pray that, Lord, that we do what you say so it would be changed forever. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I just want to give a little bit of context here. Uh, the letter is written to the churches in Galatia, a Roman province, which is truly a masterpiece of the Apostle Paul's writings as he interprets Scripture with Scripture and comes up with this fundamental core belief of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, all of the six chapters is like a letter, is a letter and it's like a plumb line from which we can set and concrete to correct our thinking attitude and therefore our behavior by. So I'm going to go through these verses. And if you want a title today, I've called it Run, Forest, Run. It's a famous line from my all-time favorite movie, Forrest Gump, back in 1994, I think it is. And it's about a boy who grew up in Greenbow, Alabama, 
whose simple way of thinking, just deciding to, to do things what he wants to do, and circumstances that come his way, he just decides to do it, and, and through that, fulfilling amazing accomplishments, he becomes a war hero, uh, he becomes a worldwide celebrity, and a bunch of other things. But at the beginning of the movie, uh, there's a scene when growing up, uh, he has issues, growth in his legs, and he's got these metal braces on. And in the scene, he's down this dirt path with a friend, and these guys, these boys from the town, who don't obviously like him, are beginning to hurl insults at him. And they pick up rocks and they start throwing stuff at him. And so Jenny, his friend, says those famous words, Run, Forrest, run! I'm not going to try to do the accent. I'm not going to offend everyone. She says, run, Forrest, run! And so he starts to run. And as he's running faster and faster, and the boys are trying to catch up, pelting rocks at him, he's running, and the, the metal braces on his legs start to come loose and break free. And as he's running, he's running away from the accusers of the boys, saying, you're useless, you're hopeless, you're worthless. And he's running at the same time towards what's ahead of him, forward, saying, I'm free, and the restrictions come off his legs, and he's running towards his destiny. And he made a good choice. He was running towards his destiny without being bound up or enslaved by his accusers. And my attempt this morning is to see from Scripture not to listen to the lies, but to run forward with the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. So this morning, I want to proclaim this to you. The gospel really sets you free. And I want to look more into that. The gospel the, means good news is more than just your past life forgiven and going to heaven in the future. Many Christians forget or don't know how to live life in this present current day. So you have a bunch of people who call themselves Christians who are frantically living life with confusion, guilt, and uncertainty of their privilege and position in their standing in Christ. And, and when they do that, they really haven't grasped the gospel at all. And this is why Paul writes this letter. Because it's the power and the presence of God in us today by his Holy Spirit living within us, that we've received acceptance and inheritance, a new identity, but most of all, an intimate relationship with God himself, who we can call Father. But unfortunately, that is not always the experience of many believers. So I want to look at two things this morning. First is, how is this freedom found? Then secondly, how is this freedom lost? So how is this freedom found? Well, it says this in chapter 4, verse 3. In the same way, we were also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary, pre, uh, elementary uh, principles of the world. At the same chapter in verse 8, it says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those by nature are not God's. Did you pick up the key word? You were. It's past tense. This remarkable transformation has already happened. In other words, I was in this miserable place, but I'm not now. And those in the same verses, in the same passage that Paul writes, here's another thing we see. In chapter 3, verse 26, it says, For in Christ Jesus... You are all sons of God through faith. Now, when we say sons, it's metaphoric for children, both male and female. It's not just, just male, but the children of God. You are. In verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor, nor female. You are all one in Christ. Verse 29, and you are Christ. Then in, uh, sorry, you are Christ. Then you are Abraham's offspring as according to the promise. And in chapter 4, verse 6, B 
Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And one more, just to finish it off, in verse 7 of chapter 4. So you are no longer slaves, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I think you've picked up the key word there. You are, which is present tense. In other words, the place and position that you are right now. So you were, and then there is you are. You once were, but you, and then you are now. Now, Satan would love us not to believe this. Instead, he wants us to be focused on ourselves and our faults, our failures, our shortcomings, our mistakes. He wants to blind us of what God has already done for us. Satan wants to deceive us by thinking like a slave. And if you allow him to do that, you will neither be running freely or fruitfully the race marked out for you. Slavery has no freedom. You're simply told what to do. And no matter how hard you try or how hard you work, because you think like a slave, you'll never run with joy and peace that is given to us. It's like a hamster on a wheel. You're stuck running frantically faster and faster, but going nowhere. And so there are many people who believe themselves to be Christians, but are constantly telling themselves they are slaves. Here's what it looks like. Uh, some examples. I've got this habitual sin. I can't help it. It's just the way I am. I've tried and I've just learned to accept it and live with it. It's just who I am. Another one would be, I got this rebellious attitude towards my boss, towards authority. My parents were like that. I guess it's in my family genes. Or another one may be, I've struggled to forgive myself because of the guilt I feel because of the things I did in the past that I'm ashamed of. Now, what you're really saying when you, when you say those things, you think those things, what you're really saying and thinking is you're acting like a slave. And when you say that, you are, in essence, denying the gospel. It might explain why you think that way, like a slave, but it doesn't excuse what the Bible says you are today. So how do we find this freedom? How do we believe and receive and experience this freedom? In chapter 3, verse 26, it's very simple. Here it goes. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. It's through faith. Through faith and faith alone and nothing else. I think we've had a kind of a theme running through the weeks. Jesus plus nothing equals everything, equals everything by faith. And actually, the underlining theme of this letter is all about applying your faith to what God has already done, to what God has already said, to what God has already given to you in Christ Jesus. And there's only one way that we can truly find freedom in Christ. And that is to affirm and believe the gospel is actually true for you and for me. We cannot expect any victory if we are believing the lie and not embracing the truth. Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. So, if you confess to be a follower of Jesus, here's what to do. Now, we fall into sins many times, and the past is forgiven by the grace of God. But today, you and I stand here not as a slave, but as God's child, in whom his spirit now lives. And because I know that to be true, and believe this by faith, I can stand up against this temptation because God says he's made a way of escape. And because that's true, I don't have to fall into it. And we receive that by faith. You are free because God says 
you're not a slave, but a son. You know, one of the greatest examples of faith in the Bible is the story of Joseph. Joseph, a young, innocent man, grew up and was falsely accused by his brothers, falsely accused by people in authority over him. He was thrown into prison, and a couple of guys have a couple of dreams, and the guys say, well, who can tell me the meaning of these dreams? And it was Joseph in the, in the, in the prison cell says, God interprets, dream, uh, God interprets dreams. Tell me your dream. It's that point when Joseph said that, he was speaking faith. It was that point that he knew he was a son. He believed God's promises in the circumstance that he was in. He didn't have the mentality or the attitude of being a victim of the past or, his, or the present circumstances. He just simply believed by faith. It's simple, but it's not easy because our Western minds needs to rationalize everything in order to believe. One of my favorite preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, said this, this then is one reason why men do not believe and live because they are too proud to be saved by a simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact is that it's hard because it's easy. It is diffi difficult because there's no difficulty in it. And it seems so obscure simply because it is so clear. We've just got to simply believe. How do we exercise faith? Just do what God says about you. Now, Paul wrote this letter because you can lose the experience of faith. So how can this freedom uh, of, can, can be lost? Now, Paul identifies two ways of going back to being slave. Abuse your freedom by indulging in the flesh or abandoning your freedom by going back to the law. And in this passage we're looking at, we're going to see how going back to the law can make you a slave. Now remember, Paul wrote to Christians, so the temptation is real, very subtle, and it's easy to abandon this freedom. So what is the law? Well, much of the law is how to live the Christian life, which is in the first five books of the Bible, written by Moses, the Pentateuchs. It's in the Old Testament. And it's a lot of instructions, uh, lots of daily duties to perform of how God's people relate to God. And there are circumstances if you disobeyed them. So the law came from God. So it was good and it was spiritual. But the Bible also said that something better for the future was planned for us. So there's a prophet named Ezekiel and he said this. He said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you, uh, that I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone and give you your flesh, and, sorry, and give from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So it says there, the prophet is saying, I will give you a new heart where I put my spirit in. And this promise was actually started to be fulfilled when God spoke to an individual, a guy named Abraham. And God said to this, wandering pagan just walking around in a desert he's just chose him and said Abraham I'm going to give you a promise and he says look look towards heaven he says can you number the stars he says if you are able to number them and he said to him so shall your offspring be and he also said you will be the father of many nations a blessing to the nations because of the seed of your faith and it says and he believed God, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And then Paul wrote another letter to the Romans, and in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring is that he would be an heir to the world that would not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And now when we come to this Galatian passage, chapter 3, verse 4, it says this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. In other words, this has been fulfilled. That 
that word that was given through that prophet Ezekiel was fulfilled in Jesus, through Jesus, that we are redeemed those under the law. We've died to the law so that we might receive the, this gift of righteousness and live out this glorious freedom, not under the law, the rules and regulations of the first five books of the Bible, but by faith. And that we will have this new heart that is filled with the new Holy Spirit in us. And it's not written on the hearts of stone anymore. It's really good news. And it sets us free. God puts that within us. So why would we want to become slaves again? Why would we want to come back under the law? What I believe in our fallen nature is easier to live by the law than a loving relationship. Relationship to law gives us clear limits of what we can and what we cannot do. Relationship of love has no limits. There, I think there's a deep human instinct in us, in our human nature, that we want limits. And that it gives us a sense of comfort and security. It looks something like this. Just tell me what to do. Just give me the list how to do it. Tell me what to do it is to be a good Christian. Tell me how much of the Bible I should read. Uh, what I should pray for. What list should I have to pray? Tell me what to wear. Tell me what good deeds I should do. Is there something in our human nature that once I've been told what to do and we fulfilled them, it makes us feel good. It makes us look good. And therefore, it must make God happy. There's something about checking off a list that makes you feel completely satisfied, right? I know that's me. People who know me know this is Simon. I am king of lists. But I want to tell you something right now. I never feel satisfied or done enough. You can be a slave to saying your prayers. You can be a slave of reading your Bible. You can have this slave mentality of how you relate to God. But at the same time, you can feel useless because you're thinking, when is enough enough? And so Satan would use the law to reveal sin and drive people to despair. God uses it to reveal sin and call people to the gift of repentance and find forgiveness. Satan use the final steps to condemn people. God uses the law to the final step to liberty. Satan uses the law as a dead end, while God uses the law as a highway to run in freedom. Let me make this very clear to you. My righteousness, your righteousness and standing in God is not because of the quality or the quantity of how I live my Christian life but it's because of the love of God who came and died for me. And by faith, I believe this freedom is for me because he says, I'm not a slave, but a son. The law limits, love has no limits. Let me give you an example. When I finished high school, that summer when I finished high school, uh, I worked for my uncle who was a dairy farmer. And I remember the herds of cows that he had. Uh, he's, they're in the fields with thousands of acres. But I noticed the cows did not ever drift off or get lost or, or anything like that. And then I saw in the middle of the field where the cows were, food right there in the middle. And I heard a cow's motivation to stay together is different when you have food in the middle of the field. They don't want to go any, anywhere. They're nourished and getting fed. But they didn't have any boundaries or fencing as well. And it's same for us with God. When you have God's Holy Spirit within us, and he tells us he loves us, and when he woos us to himself, and we keep ourselves within God's love, and it nourishes our souls, and it does us good, we don't need boundaries. We are completely satisfied because of his love. 
Jesus wants you to go beyond the law in order to relate to you and me in love. So much so that it says in the Bible, greater love than no man that he would lay down his life for his friends. He came into the world to die for you and for me for our sins and to relate to us, not out of the law, but out of love for you and me. All right, this is my last point I want to mention. Chapter four, verse five says this, God sent his son to redeem those who are under law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. His spirit in you cries, Abba, Father. Uh, Abba meaning Aramaic for daddy. This is about a relationship with God that you experience personal love for you. It's not just in your head, it's in your heart. And it's a thing of great beauty and deep delight. As sons, as children, children of God, we have received an inheritance, a new identity, but most significantly, we receive intimacy with God himself. I was adopted at the age of two, and I thank my mum who decided to adopt me into the family. And uh, although I grew up and loved um, the best they can, I know that at the age of 19, when I became a follower of Jesus, it's only then I really did find and discover true, lasting love, knowing God as my father. And I know I can come to him 24-7, day and night, no limits, and no restrictions. You know, when I thought about this, there's a different relationship that children have with their parents than any other relationship status. Having the privilege of parenting, fathering two daughters, I know that there is no awareness of them, around them, of feeling inhabited, inhibited, sorry, or limited to run to their father. When they were young, they used to burst through the door as little girls and say, Daddy, Daddy, put this dress on, put this nail polish on and let's play. These days, now they're grown up, they're saying, they burst through the door and say, Daddy, Daddy, can I borrow your credit card or I just venmo you a request? <laughs> the children's access to the father knows no boundaries. They're not inhibited at all. And the father doesn't stop them coming in, coming to them. Tim Keller said this, Abba Father signifies a confidence of love and assurance of welcome. Just as a child simply assumes a parent loves them and is there for them and never doubts the security of openness of the daddy's strong arms, so Christians can have an overwhelming boldness and certainty that God loves them endlessly. God loves you endlessly. You know, I've been a Christian for 30 something plus years. But I can personally say in the last couple of years, I've spent more time pondering about God's love for me than rather coming and praying with a list. And I can honestly say that my heart and my attitude has changed a lot. And I found a lot, lot more freedom in my life. And with this next slide, I found this, that Meditating on God's love has done more to increase my love for others than decades of effort trying to be more loving. And it's just like the Holy Spirit that lives within you, that cries, Abba, Father. It's like an overflowing fountainhead, endlessly going in, going out, rather than mechanical pumping of a pump, trying to make it work with lots of effort. So I just want to finish. How do we keep living in this freedom? It's simply living by faith. Just let the word of God keep telling you what you are and who you are in Christ Jesus. Faith. Run from the accuser and run the race of freedom marked out for every single one of you. Put your name in the middle of the two words of run. Run, Simon, run. Run, John, run. Run, Jane, run. Run with this freedom. 
And the other thing with this freedom is that when you understand the grace of God and the freedom that we have, it's the most wonderful and effective witness and light that you can bring that people see this freedom. Let me finish by asking you this question. Do you experience this freedom? Do you know this deep love of the Father deep down where you can cry, Abba, Father, within, within you? Will you allow yourself to be deeply loved today? Why don't we pray? Father, I just want to thank you for this wonderful message of freedom. I want to ask, Lord, help us to run away from the accusers, run from the lies and to run into the stream that we have. Father, I also want to pray for people, maybe first time feeling convicted and thinking, can I really have a relationship with God where I can deeply call him Father? I ask and thank you for the invitation that you give that we can make those first steps to receiving and experiencing your love in this way. And Father, I also want to ask that, Lord, help us to keep ourselves within this love by doing what you say. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Simon, for sharing that with us today. I uh, just wanted to share a couple of things with you about our summertime. Most of you have probably heard at this point that we will be canceling our Southeast celebration. Uh, we're a part of a family of churches called Confluence. And generally, we would have uh, a conference over the summertime that would be called Celebration Southeast. And we would gather together with the churches in the Southeast region of the United States. And we're not going to be doing that this year, unfortunately. But we do have some exciting things coming up, and I do want to share those with you. So instead of celebration, so generally we would have celebration in the different regions throughout the United States. So we'd have Northeast and Northwest and all those different kinds. But instead of doing that, in light of COVID-19, we're actually going to be doing a, something called Better Together. And so it's going to be a week of prayer where we're going to be spending time each day praying into different topics together with the churches across the U.S. and Mexico, all the churches that we're connected to within our Confluence family. And then on the, the Sunday, on the 28th, June 28th on that Sunday, we'll all hear the same message from Brian Mowry, who he's the one who oversees Confluence in the U.S. and Mexico and so we'll all hear the same message that morning after a week of prayer, which will start on June 21st. So it'll be June 21st to June 28th. So please mark, please mark your calendar for that. We're really looking forward to it. And then also uh, during our celebration conference, we generally take up an offering. And it, we, over the past like three years or so, this offering has gone to help build a school in Mozambique. And so we're connected to another group of churches in Mozambique um, and we're all part of a wider family of churches called New Frontiers, but they're building a high school there, and we've committed to help them do that. And so we'd still, even though we're not going to be gathering for celebration, we'd still like to take up this offering. And the date that we're going to be doing that is actually on June 14th. And so I just want to encourage you just to be praying and asking God what he would have you contribute to this offering. Now, we've gone through a lot over these past months, and it's been difficult, it's been uncertain, but there's been some of us who really haven't been affected financially at all by what's happened with COVID-19. And we've gotten these stimulus checks, and, and things have changed, and it's just kind of been extra money for us. And I, I just want to encourage you to really consider using that money for kingdom purposes. You know, the Bible talks time and time again about how People who are in more affluent areas are to help churches and their brothers and sisters in Christ in the poorer areas of the world. And that's exactly where we, we are in, the affluent area of America. And Mozambique is, is the second poorest nation in the world. And there's people there that are doing tremendous work. And their kids are getting older and they're getting to that high school age. And so they're getting to this place where they're really going to need this high school to be built in order for them to continue the work that's happening in Mozambique. And so I just want to encourage you just to think through uh, the use of that stimulus money uh, towards this offering 
or potentially, you know, we're not going to be going to Celebration Southeast, so you won't be spending the money on registration costs or, or hotel or anything like that. So just consider as well the money that you would have spent on your travel. That's just another way that you could possibly give a little bit more towards this offering. And, and just on top of that, whatever you feel like God's leading you to give, we just want you to do that in faith. We don't want you to do it under obligation. God loves a cheerful giver. But I just want, you, want to encourage you just to be thinking through that. And again, the offering is going to be taken up on June 14th. Now, a lot of you may have been wondering and are probably asking the question, when are we going to be gathering again physically? And so I want to answer that question here and now. So one of the things that we really feel like we need to have in place before we're able to meet physically is live streaming, the ability to live stream. So right now, these services are pre-recorded. They're pre-recorded during the week, and then we broadcast them on Sunday mornings. But we really need the ability to be able to broadcast what we're preaching at the same time, so live streaming. Because there will be people, when we start to meet physically again, who will still need to stay home. And so I just want to let you guys know, we have a team who's working very diligently to make that a reality for us. And our goal is to actually open four uh, Sunday services on June 21st. And so that's our goal. Um, now, it, it may be the following Sunday or even the first Sunday in July, but that's our goal. And so I just want to let you guys know that, um, that we're working hard for that. And so please, please be praying for the team as they're, we're trying to get all of that together. And this is, again, th and this is based on the information that we have now. So Things could change. As you know, things have been changing daily. And so I just encourage you, just, or I just ask, if you would, please just stay patient with us, and we'll try to communicate with you as the best we can as to how exactly we're going to execute this, because it will be different. It won't be the same as a regular Sunday. We'll have to do things differently, but we're still navigating exactly how that's going to look. And so please stay tuned for that. We'll send out information as we know it, and I appreciate your patience, and thank you so much. So at this time, we are going to be taking up our offering. Even though we're distanced from one another, we still want to make giving a part of our worship. If you're a guest with us this morning, we want to release you from that. Don't worry about this segment. But if, you're, if you would call Jubilee your home, we want to remind you there's three ways you can give, either Venmo, check, or online. So please go ahead and do that now. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope you have a great week.